frankly, we hadn't seen a lot of officers up until this point, but they are blocking, as you can see, the entrance ramp uh, onto the main highway out of downtown. And what you have here is face-to-face -face this entire group, hundreds of protesters, again, literally face-to-face -face with uh, these officers that are in riot gear. It's just signs of activity, signs of life that a year ago today were completely destroyed in just a matter of about 24 hours. Uh, entire areas here level. But if the president uh, follows through on his vow to bring migrants to sanctuary cities like Sacramento, and by the way, that's a big if, uh, Mayor Steinberg says bring on the migrants. He says we are a sanctuary city. We will protect that population. But there are legitimate questions about what that would look like. Cap to cap team members haven't met with members of Congress about cybersecurity until this year. And uh, the congressman's concern is just that we may not have the infrastructure right now to protect our elections. This vigil uh, to pray for the three people who were killed and the dozen people who are still recovering now uh, set to begin in about a half hour. But we got here a half hour ago. And since then, it has really just ballooned. I and mean, you can see just by the sheer amount of people that have come and that have shown up, uh, what kind of support uh, they have for this entire community. Protesters decided they were just going to sort of get up and organically start to march. So they came uh, northbound on Freeport. They're now going the other way. They stopped for a while at Sutterville. It was sort of uh, the busiest intersection that they had come across. Now, again, going the other way back toward the police station. Now, I want to give you an idea of what the police presence is. If you turn around, this is behind this protest. From this home, you can actually see the vantage point of this fire miles away, the wind blowing it in the opposite direction. Well, at some point, that wind changed course and the fire took its toll on this home, which now lies in rubble. Some of the ashes here still smoldering. Yeah, Eric, the county is now asking the state of California to help pick up the tab on the Golden State Killer suspect Joseph D'Angelo's trial in a really big way. There's a bill in the state assembly that's going to do just that. And remember, this case it goes back 40 years, so that is a ton of material evidence investigating that needs to be done. A lot of manpower and money goes along with that. Shoes on the ground, bags, things that people left behind really tells a story of uh, a mass panic as people were leaving that area. You can see uh, over my shoulder the Mandalay Bay Resort with those windows still the shot out Republican Assemblyman James Gallagher, as you mentioned, leading that call. Now, this has been framed as a free speech issue. He says that's not the case. Uh, he says this was a clear call to action for violence against police officers. We talked to him about election interference, particularly uh, ahead of the 2020 election. And, you know, on the heels of uh, the Mueller report being released, this is something that Congress is laser focused on. And a lot of our members of Congress from California are right at the heart of that effort. Historically, the incumbent president's party does lose races right. yep. in the midterm. But is this an exceptional year because of the Trump effect? Michael there talking to us about preparing to walk across the graduation stage. Well, today, this was the moment that he actually did it. Amazing here to see him and to see that dream really come to fruition. There are still a number of hot spots they want to address that are near homes. And until they do, they say those mandatory evacuations are going to stay in place. He has certainly had an incredibly busy election day. You know, a lot of politicians sort of take election day as sort of a victory lap, but he was basically campaigning. Now, when we say the developments on the border between these two towns, we literally mean the border. This sign marks the beginning of Loomis. Now, this open field right next to it is where this Costco is going to be. And if you take a look at where the traffic is coming from, it's all toward the highway, all of which is on the Rockland side. So while, again, we are celebrating uh, a year later life coming back and uh, people rebuilding their homes and their lives, there is still a sense that we can't forget the lives lost. Six-day-old Hallie is the last baby born at Feather River Hospital. Just moments after she arrived, the campfire began to surround the building. It came over the speaker, evacuate the hospital, all patients need to be moved. I went to my patients' rooms and I said, just grab your baby, we gotta go, just grab your baby, there's no time. In the scramble to evacuate, Hallie's mother, Heather, had been separated from her child, put into an ambulance and driven away. Her ambulance made it about half a mile before it began to literally melt in the flames. Her C-section surgery left her lower half of her body numb. She couldn't move and made what she thought would be her last phone call. I said goodbye to my husband and just told him to tell our kids that I love them and that I was sorry. I was sorry I wouldn't be there. Wow. It was very, very hard. And I heard the ambulance in front of us is on fire. Nurse Tamara Ferguson was in an ambulance behind Heather's. 
making the same last phone call to her family. They kept telling me like, no, you're gonna be fine. And I kept trying to convince them, no, you don't understand. I'm not going to be fine. There's no way I'm going to survive this. There's fire blowing at me. As the fire was consuming homes all around them, a stranger helped Heather get out of her ambulance and wheeled her up this driveway on Chloe Court. Nurse Tamara followed. Eventually, they ran into David Hawks, Paradise's fire chief. There's a dog door here that one of the paramedics made access to. We unlocked the garage, moved patients into this home and sheltered them in place. I said, hey, if you if you follow the directions, which is to clear this home of pine needles, that we would be safe here. What happened next was nothing short of amazing. EMTs and nurses became stand-in firefighters. Some getting on the roof of this home, clearing gutters of brush, hosing down the outer edge of the property, saving this home all while their patients were kept safe inside. And he said, you do this, you do this, you do this. And all of us shifted our minds to what do we need to do for survival mode here. They followed directions. They did exactly what I asked them to do. Amid a neighborhood devastated by the campfire, this Chloe Court home survived. So did all of the patients and medical staff inside. I am so happy that my home was spared so that their lives could be spared. That was that home's purpose, was to save those people. Desiree Borden owns this home with her husband. Not long before it was used to save lives of people she'd never met, she was fleeing from it with her 17-month-old daughter in the car. I was singing nursery rhymes to her, um, trying to keep her calm, although she was very calm. I don't know if I was singing the nursery rhymes for her or for me. <laughs> I, just did, I just knew that our story couldn't end that way. We couldn't burn alive in a car. It wasn't until one of the nurses sent Desiree a Facebook message that she learned her home was still standing. She'd assumed, like her neighbor's homes, it was gone. Now, these people, all strangers a few days ago, forever bonded through one common story of survival. We're all here. We're able to talk about this and it's, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's humbling to know that your life was spared when so many aren't and so many are unaccounted for. In the panic following the gunfire at the Gilroy Garlic Festival, thousands wondered what was happening, but only a few had this reaction. Oh man, this is not happening again. Not happening again. This is Alicia Olive Sunday escaping the mass shooting in Gilroy. And this is Alicia Olive, October 1st, 2017, escaping the mass shooting at the Route 91 Music Festival in Las Vegas. I went into a really deep depression. I can't, I would go into either if it's a bar or sometimes just a crowded area and something about it just, I start to panic. Alicia says it took almost two years after Vegas, but she was just starting to feel safe in public places. And then she came to Gilroy at the Garlic Festival with two friends she met in a Las Vegas shooting support group. Now all three are part of a small group of Americans with a distinction none of them wants. They've survived two mass shootings. After the Vegas shooting, I felt like I would be there again, and it happened. Angry, um, it makes you angry. Alicia says she was near the concert stage where the shooter entered the festival. She and her friends left, but before they hit the exit, they heard gunshots. I said, I cannot, I can't believe this happening again. And I just, because we were trying to find somewhere to get cover. Now, her somber message for others massacres can happen anywhere. But she says accepting tragedy as inevitable isn't good enough. She is a living call to action. We can't tell that to the families that lost someone. To say, oh, well, it's, that's life, that's America, is not enough. I think it's time to say enough's enough. And enough is enough for her. She says after both of these mass shootings, she's now going to become more active in fighting what she calls the inaction on mass shootings and on gun violence generally in this country. Eric, Nikki. Joe, unbelievable story. Thank you so much. The immigration battle between California and the Trump administration has been heating up for months. And today, the battlefront moved to Sacramento. California absolutely appears to me is using every power it has, powers it doesn't have, 
to frustrate federal law enforcement. So you can be sure I'm going to use every power I have to stop that. U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions announcing the Justice Department is suing California over three laws dealing with immigration policy that Sessions says put the state at odds with the federal government. There is no nullification. There is no secession. Federal law is the supreme law of the land. Sessions went after California's sanctuary state law, which bars local law enforcement from working with the feds to detain undocumented people, and two other state laws, which Sessions says offers protection for undocumented criminal elements. I also Calling out Oakland Mayor Libby Schaaf by name for warning undocumented communities that ICE raids were coming. To Mayor Schaaf, how dare you? How dare you needlessly endanger the lives of our law enforcement officers to promote a radical open borders agenda. What is really truly needed is clarity. Former Sacramento Sheriff John McGinnis introduced Sessions to this law enforcement group. He says California laws make officers' jobs tougher, having to toe the line between federal and state rules. But ultimately that will have to be decided by the court now. There is a large undocumented population in the Sacramento region, however, not committing crimes. And according to Sacramento Police, Police Chief Daniel Hahn, they also need protecting. People in our community are concerned, and we strive really hard to ensure people are comfortable talking to the Sacramento Police Department. Now, it's interesting that the legal precedent for this lawsuit against the state of California is USA v. Arizona, which was an Obama administration suit against the state of Arizona because its local officers were indiscriminately asking people for their legal documents. Now, the Trump administration is using that same case and that same argument against California. Seeing him gets better helps me cope with this tragedy every single moment. For the fourth day in a row, Lene Sampson is at Valley Hospital visiting Luca Ikloda, a young man she didn't know before Sunday, a young man who, without her, likely wouldn't be alive today. So trying to get into this trailer, and all of a sudden he says to me, I've been hit. She was working behind the bar at the Country Music Festival when the gunfire started. While hundreds were running away as a man rained bullets down from the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Resort into a crowd, Samson stopped for Luca, holding him up as the two took cover. And I pull back my hand and I'm covered in blood. I'm just covered and all I see is Luca in his hand, his other hand, his phone and the picture of his mom. And at that point, I literally just had to say, okay, I can't, I can't leave you. Let's go. We have to get out of here. We have to move from this spot right now. I don't want nobody to go through that kind of, no parents to feel that. It wasn't until he was safely at the hospital that Samson got a hold of Trianne et Claudine, Luca's father. But not before she got Luca into a wheelbarrow and rolled him into an ambulance. I don't think I prayed in the last 20 years uh, together how much I prayed in that night. The prayers worked. After seven grueling hours in the OR, Samson never leaving his side, doctors told Luca's parents their son would survive. He did lose a portion of his right lung, but every day, doctors have told his family he's getting stronger. Talking still leaves him in pain, but when Luca sees Samson, his hand gestures convey how thankful he is. And I don't know if God just put me in the right spot at the right time and made me strong enough for the both of us. I don't know. We are overwhelmed. I, 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 can, I, I, I don't know. I have no words to, to say right now how, how uh, happy we are and uh, blessed. Eclodan says Samson is now like family. He calls her Luca's angel. Thank you. Story. I will never be able to. <laughs> and while she doesn't have wings, seeing Luca strong enough to smile makes her feel like she's soaring. He's my hero. He's surviving every day. And every minute he gets better and we've it just makes me even more happy and ex excited about everything.